Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alexa Harvey. I'm a graduate student at the University of Georgia studying equine nutrition um, with an emphasis in microbiome research. Um, so I am going to make an informational presentation on a topic that I would like to discuss. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I will go ahead and get started. So um, today I would like to talk about the effects of endophyte infected tall fescue on reproduction performance in cattle. So I um, <clears throat> really don't know all of the information that goes along with this issue. However, I've been researching it and I find it very interesting um, because tall fescue is a um, very popular forage for cattle producers um, all over the US. Um, and it is used almost universally everywhere um, in the US as um, in pastures, um, it's very affordable. It has become very competitive um, compared to other cooler season grasses. And so people tend to use it. However, there is um, a lot of research that's been conducted on the effects of the endophyte infected tall fescue that um, is toxic to livestock. So I'm gonna touch on the specifics um, of the effects of tall fescue toxicosis on reproduction. Um, however, but there's a lot of recorded effects um, that aren't directly related to reproduction um, in livestock as well. So what is the mechanism that makes tall fescue toxic to livestock? Um, and it is, so basically it is a fungus that lives within tall fescue um, and it actually helps the plant survive. So the fungus is very beneficial to the plant. However, it's very toxic to livestock. And the fungus is technically called an endophyte. So the endophyte, the fungus produces things called ergot alkaloids. Um, and technically it produces alkaloids and there's, you know, different ergot alkaloids called, there's some on here, it's called lolene and ergovaline. Um, so in the research that I have studied, there has not been any research to prove that lolene is um, toxic to livestock. However, ergovaline, ergotamine, um, those ergot alkaloids are very toxic and are the primary um, reasons for toxicosis, fescue toxicosis in livestock and in cattle primarily. Um, and it just says right here, fescue toxicosis is a multi-phase syndrome, just meaning that it is not, it does not just cause one symptom. Um, there are many things that are related to fescue toxicosis. So what is, you know, one of the main reasons that fescue toxicosis affects reproduction? So one of the symptoms, major symptoms of fescue toxicosis is something called vasoconstriction. Um, so vasoconstriction, um, like on the slide, it is a constricting uh, or narrowing of blood vessels. So this can cause many different effects, um, but some of them include increased vascular resistance to blood flow, um, decreased blood flow near the skin, increased blood pressure inside the blood vessel near the skin, and it can also narrow blood capillaries near the skin and dilate deeper blood vessels. So Right here, here is a normal cross-section um, or the most left blood vessel. And the normal cross-section, um, you know, it's kind of a middle ground. Um, vasoconstriction is the actual constricting or narrowing of that blood, blood vessel. <clears throat> and the vasodilation, the most right figure, um, is actually the dilation or, you know, increased um, area of the blood vessel. So again, this has a lot of effect on, um, resistance of blood flow, blood flow in general. Um, and again, I would like to point out this, you know, one point about decreased blood flow near the skin. Blood flow near the skin is very important in our body's ability to thermoregulate. Um, so there has been a lot of research that's been done on this vasoconstriction theory and decreased blood flow near the skin affecting, um, you know, livestock's natural ability to thermoregulate, um, which is something I'll get into a little bit later. But one of the main studies that I would like to talk about today that go along with um, 
reproduction issues with um, fescue toxicosis is ergot alkaloids induce vasoconstriction of bovine uterine and ovarian vessels. This study was done by Daniel H. Poor, Sarah E. Lyons, Rebecca K. Poole, and Matt H. Poor. Um, so this objective, I mean, this um, study was not done that long ago. Again, this is a more getting more research um, topic recently than it has been in the last 10 years. Um, so the objective of this study was to determine if chronic exposure of ergot alkaloids from endophyte infected tall fescue reduces systemic blood flow to the reproductive organs in heifers and thus hindering reproductive function in these heifers. <clears throat> So the materials and method of this study um, included 36 purebred Angus heifers. And before you know, any measurements were taken, they actually used um, the normal protocol of um, syncing their cycle, estrus cycles. And they confirmed that they, um, all 36 Angus heifers had achieved puberty and were on the same cyclicity. So the heifers were randomly assigned to receive either endophyte infected fescue seed, which is what they, you know, acronymed as E+, which incorporated 500 micrograms of ergovalene and ergotamine, which are the toxic um, ergot alkaloids per kilogram. This came in a fescue seed type called Southern States Kentucky 31. So Kentucky 31 is a general name of fescue seed that a lot of cattle producers, hay producers um, use, and they just say Kentucky 31. However, um, in the study, they incorporated the actual non-infected fes non fescue seed, which is um, the acronym they created was E minus, and it included zero micrograms of ergotamine per kilogram. It is actually called Pennington Kentucky 31. So it is also a Kentucky 31 type, same type of fescue seed. However, um, the brand Pennington has came out with a non-infected or non-infected um, fescue seed. So. They were able to supplement both of these seeds into a TMR that they had already um, created and tested before the study also. Um, so it was just a corn silage shuttle mix ration for a 36-day treatment. So they treated these um, heifers for 36, I mean, 63 days um, for the treatment period with the infected or non-infected pesky seed. So measurements were taken weekly. So they had a ton of measurements. Um, so I'm just gonna read some of these out, especially the acronyms. So they took um, just reading left to right, body weight, body condition score, respiration rate, rectal temperature, hair coat score, hair shedding score, skin temperature, heart rate, caudal systolic and diastolic beat blood pressure, caudal vein and artery diameter, blood samples, uterine and, and ovarian characteristics, antral follicular counts, luteal area, uterine and ovarian vein and artery vessel area, and serum concentrations of progesterone. So they had a ton of measurements, um, but I'll point some out that are related, directly related to the vasoconstriction theory um, is the caudal vein and artery diameter, um, the caudal systolic and diastolic blood pressure, the um, uterine and ovarian vein and artery vessel area. Um, so those are directly related to the concept of vasoconstriction. So the results and discussion in the study, they saw um, some different things. So I'm gonna go through them kind of specifically. Um, so they found that average daily gain was actually greater in heifers on the non-infected fescue seed than the heifers on the infected fescue seed. So they got average daily gain from their body weight and body condition score measurements that they took. Um, so they actually saw a correlation. They saw treatment times day of interaction on body weight of the heifers. So day of interaction being the day of treatment, you know, how long they've been on the um, type of treatment and treatment being the type of treatment on body weight. So basically what they saw was body weight started to decrease after 21 days of exposure to ergot alkaloids and body condition sore there also decrease when body weight decreased. So basically they found that heifers on this infected fescue seed actually had less growth and had decrease of growth after a certain day of exposure to these ergot alkaloids. Um, so another thing that they saw was hair coat score and hair shedding score. 
So they followed a specific protocol about how to um, measure the hair coat score and hair shedding score, and it involved using a um, certain type of clipper on a certain setting, clipping the hair and actually measuring the volume of hair um, for the hair coat score and actually taking a like measurement of from skin to hair follicle for hair shedding score. So they found that hair coat score and hair shedding score were actually higher for heifers consuming the infected fescue seed. Um, however, they found that rectal, rectal temperature, skin surface temperature, heart rate, both blood pressure measurements and respiration rates stayed the same between both treatment groups. So again, blood pressure also has to go into, you know, stress environments, um, stress of environment and stuff. So they included the blood pressure me um, measurements in the hair cut score and hair shedding score section. But basically what they were saying is that when you have cows that are in heat stress, um, or in extreme temperature, sometimes blood pressure can change because of that. And the hair coat score and hair shedding score actually is directly related to um, heat stress to extreme temperatures in cattle, and which can actually cascade events into a higher rectal temperature, skin surface temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, all of these things. So um, they did not find any correlation with the latter measurements. However, they did find that hair coat score and hair shedding score were higher for heifers consuming the infected tall fescue scene. So one thing that they wanted to point out is that they might not have found a correlation with the latter measurements because these heifers were actually housed in a covered barn. Um, and I think the median temperature, they had all the data, weather data in the study, but the median temperature was um, around 27 degrees Celsius. So nothing extreme. Um, so again, you know, they said that it could have been that these heifers were not exposed to sunlight exposure and therefore, you know, housed in a pretty regulated temperature area. So they didn't experience any heat stress or extreme temperatures. Um, and so they could have, data could have not been found because of that. So just to note. So heifers on the non-infected fescue seed diet had a greater caudal artery area than heifers on the infected fescue seed. However, no difference was reported between the two treatment groups related to caudal vein area. So again, they found that the infected fescue seed could have, or they found that heifers on the non-infected fescue seed had a greater caudal artery area. So the artery itself had a greater area inside than the caudal artery area of the heifers that is, were on the um, infected fescue seed. So they also found that uterine artery area, uterine artery and vein vessel areas were not different between the two treatment groups on day zero and 14 of the estrous cycle, which is day zero and 14 were the first two treat, um, first two measurement um, days. And then they also had 10 and 17. So um, they noted that heifers were, that were on the non-infected fescue seed diet showed greater uterine artery and vein areas compared to heifers on the infected, which is the same thing that they also found in caudal area. Um, but they found this in the uterine air, artery and vein areas on day 10 and day 17 of the estrous cycle. Um, and so what they wanted to know is that the reduction of the uterine vessel area actually occurred pretty early, like before pregnancy recognition occurred, um, maternal pregnancy recognition. So this could have a huge effect on hormonal communication between ovary and uterus. So if you have this change in area and change in blood flow to, you know, the ovary and uterus, then you could disrupt this hormonal communication in the early stages of pregnancy. So um, they also found that ovarian artery area on in heifers on the infected tall fescue seed had a reduced area. So again, this follows the same pattern for caudal artery, uterine artery and vein vessel areas. Um, and they found this also on day 10 and 17 of the estrous cycle. They did not find that the ovarian vein area um, was reduced. They actually found it was greater in heifers on the non-infected fescue seed. Um, and so they wanted to note that day zero and 17 
are very high estrogen level days in the estrus cycle. So they actually, you know, kind of pose a question. There might be a theory that ergot alkaloids may inhibit estrogen induced regulation of vascular systems. So um, that's another huge, you know, research point um, that I think that more research should be done on. So um, two more, there were no differences reported between the two treatment groups related to progesterone concentrations and prolactin concentrations. And heifers on the infected tall fescue seed had less class two follicles than heifers on the non-infected. So again, they found that these heifers that were on the infected tall fescue seed diet um, essentially had less follicles, um, volume, less volume of follicles than heifers on the E minus, e minus or non-infected fescue seed diet. So this has a huge effect in pregnancy rates and calving rates. Um, follicles are our way into pregnancy. So um, this was a huge point. Um, however, the groups related to progesterone concentrations and prolactin concentrations, they did not find um, a correlation with. So down here at the left-hand corner, this is the body weight um, data that they've created. Um, and then over to the right, these are all the measurements that they took. Um, again, so body condition score is first one, hair cut score is second one, hair shedding score is the third one, and then all the rest of them are not acronymed. Um, and so these are just some data points, data sets. Um, again, so this is the, um, in the top left, the reproductive hormones, progesterone and prolactin, the follicular characteristics. So they classified the follicles into zero, one, two, and three. So again, they did not find any correlation between zero, one, and three or did differences, but they did find that um, heifers on the infected tall fescue seed diet had less class two follicles, which is shown in this data. So bottom left is going to be the hair score data. Um, versus sample day. And then over to the right is the uterine vessel area and ovarian vessel area versus the artery and the veins in both. And so I want to touch on, so why does this matter? Um, so fescue, tall fescue is a, again, a very popular forage and seed used by producers all over the U.S., um, so we have in recent years directly related tall fescue to toxicosis in cattle. And we have now directly related to toxicosis to re reproductive issues in cattle. Um, and so I just think, you know, in a grand scheme of things, look that as a nation, we are trying to feed a growing population and cattle production is one of the main ways that we are able to achieve this. And calving rates, pregnancy success, and um, the, you know, that data is extremely important um, to our production lines and to um, economic success also. Um, so I think that there, you know, is a huge, we need to get the word out there. I think we need to, you know, educate producers um, all over the U.S. about the data that we have found related to fescue toxicosis. Um, and I think that it could be the reason for a lot of, you know, failed pregnancies um, or lower calving rates um, and that farmers, you know, or cattle producers, they don't know um, yet because we, this data needs to be out there and it needs to be presented. And, um, you know, I do think that tall fescue, especially the Southern States or Kentucky 31 brand type is a cheaper type. And I think that, um, you know, if we educate that Pennington created a Kentucky 31 type also, that is the non-infected, endophyte infected tall fescue seed. I, and that, you know, there could be um, a higher success rate for calving rates or for pregnancies in these cattle um, producers' herds, then I think that they would obviously choose the non-infected, non-endophyte infected tall fescue seed. So um, I do think that for other research um, endeavors, there could be questions about um, steers versus heifers. I think effects of um, steers or bulls versus um, heifers is extremely important. I know there was a study I read about um, that um, used bulls in their study and about the testes and the actual area um, around the testes and what the effects of toxicosis had on that. Um, on the fertility of those bulls. Um, and I also think that the um, theory of um, it affecting thermoregulation in cattle 
is extremely um, important. And I think that more research should be done in those areas. Um, but I think it's extremely important for, um, you know, the future of cattle production. And I think that um, this data is very interesting. And I think um, cattle producers would appreciate it um, also. So I think it's extremely important. I think it matters a lot. And I hope that y'all enjoyed this. And um, I hope to maybe conduct some of my own research one day in this area. Um, so these are my references and I really appreciate it. Thanks.